Um, Dr. Barber, welcome, and I'll let you take it from here. All right, thank you very much, Matt. Um, much appreciated. So um, as uh, Matt indicated, I'm Mike Barber. I'm at Torrey University of California, in lovely Vallejo. We're, uh, if you're watching this live, or for that matter, even if you're in the past, we are on our fifth day in what is our second heat warning of the summer and it's like the 11th of june so i can only imagine what august and september hold for us uh we're also in the um by the end of this week we'll be on track to have more hottest days in 2028 than we had in all of 2020 or sorry 2024 than we had in all of 2023 even though we're only half of the year through yet um, so, and last year apparently it was four times the number of hottest days ever on record compared to the previous year. Um, so, um, if you hear a fan in the background or anything like that, that's part of the reason why uh, we're all trying to keep cool on this side of the country right now. And, uh, but I'm glad to be with you guys here for a bit. Uh, so, I'm going to take you through when, when Matt started to talk to me about the uh, the, the topics that, that they had left. And, and I think he was even the one who suggested the title. It, it immediately came to mind actually a book that Stephanie uh, Moore and I, and it's mainly Stephanie Moore. Um, I was just along for the ride and assisting. Um, the work is largely her effort um, came up with. And it was a good way to frame this around. So I'm going to use this as a way to talk about uh, some of the things that, that uh, we want to think about as we're creating a, a, a virtual program. And I'll use the term virtual very loosely, and you'll see why in a second. Um, so basically, this book came about shortly after, um, I guess it was probably we started talking about it in, in early 2021, as some jurisdictions were starting to come out of the pandemic and we were finding school districts and schools and and departments of education not just here in the u.s but really around the world that had had that experience with emergency remote learning and were starting to try to figure out okay like it didn't go all that well in most cases uh, and i think didn't go all that well is a very charitable description for how it actually went uh, in most instances but there were certain things about it that, that provided some opportunities, uh, maybe for specific students or specific types of students, or maybe as a way to serve um, populations of kids that were being underserved or unserved in the current environment. So how could we start to think about um, how we could develop a, a type of program about this? Um, so we came up with this, this book, uh, you know, Online by Choice, Design Options for Flexible K-12 uh, Online Learning. Um, and it was that idea that, you know, moving from the experience we had during the pandemic to something that was more planned out. Because if you think about what happened during the pandemic, you know, we had this, this, this rush during March of and April and May of, of 2020, when we basically just tried to get devices and connectivity and some measure of something normal to folks. And that was really in that sort of phase one area that's there. Um, as folks started to get used to this and, and started to see, oh, I can use Meets or Teams or Zoom to do some of the stuff I used to do when I stood in front of the classroom, um, we started to add some of those, those basic elements back in. Uh, much of the 2020 and 21 school year, the 21-22 school year, and, and depending on where you lived, even the 22-23 school year was in that phase three where sometimes you'd be in the classroom, sometimes you might be online, and, and um, it wasn't necessarily always online because of the pandemic. Uh, if you look, uh, you know, not quite next door to you, but a couple of states over from, from Indiana right now, we've, we've seen examples in New York City where they've tried to move a couple of times this year already uh, to remote learning for um, snow events that they've had in the city. And, you know, so that idea of uh, oftentimes people call it a toggle term or a toggle semester uh, or a toggle year, if you're thinking about it throughout the year, where you can switch back and forth between. Um, this past school year, while you guys have been going through these other uh, sessions, we've really sort of hit that what I think is the new normal, that idea of, you know, we're getting past that that initial emergent kind of way. And, and the reason you're either here in person or listening to this now is because you're seriously considering, you know, what it is that we do when it comes to online learning. And you want to have a planned and prepared and well thought out way to tackle that. 
Um, and, you know, what the previous graphic doesn't really highlight all that well is, you know, if phase one began in March of 2020, well, there's a whole lot of K-12 distance learning that happened prior to March of 2020. Um, you know, if you trace the roots of, of essentially the geographic or physical distance between students and learners, just here in the United States alone, you know, you can go back well over a century. And even when you look at just the online versions of that, by the time the pandemic hit, we were already almost finishing our third decade of online learning in this in, in this country in one way or another. I mean, in many cases, it was very small. And prior to the pandemic, we might have only seen um, best estimates probably between 5 to 6% of K-12 students, so maybe one out of every 20 that had the opportunity to take an online or distance course at some point. Um, but it was still there, and, and there were still districts that were doing this, and, and in many cases, doing it quite well. Um, so when we sat down to look at the book, we started to think, okay, what are all of the different areas that people need to think about uh, when it comes to planning a online program? So if you can start with a blank slate and just use the best information that we have available to us right now, either from practitioners or from the research. And we sort of tried to organize it, starting off at an administrative standpoint. So the um, administrative decisions that you would want to take, the structural decisions, if you will, that you want to take down to the infrastructure and then into the course content and the modes of instructional delivery, the types of interactions that you're going to have with students, the types of assessment, how you're going to support learners. And, you know, so really starting from that top down model that you'd get the folks at a department of education or at a district office thinking about right down to the stuff that the teacher who is in the room trying to actually deliver on this program that's been created would need. Um, so, that's really what I want to talk a little bit about today is to go through the different steps that we have here. Um, so while this particular vignette didn't make it into the actual book, you'll notice once you hit chapter two, there's a little vignette about every single um, sort of decision type process you've got, asking you a lot of questions about it. And we framed it around this idea of the Applewood School District, which is essentially a made up school district. It's actually a term that gets used quite often. I have no idea how Applewood became the name for that school district, um, but it seems very Midwestern to me. So I think it's actually incredibly appropriate to be uh, with, with this particular group. Um, but, you know, Applewood School District in any town USA and and basically it's post pandemic and it doesn't matter if you're in a state that had the statewide supplemental programs or maybe you're in a state that has the statewide cyber charter full time programs or maybe you're in a state that's got a little bit of both. You know, there might be districts that are doing things that are operating within their boundaries or maybe that are operating and taking students from your district. You know, there's a variety of sort of settings that you could be, but they're not all that different in nature. Um, you know, and like most districts across the U.S., during the pandemic, you had to go with this, you know, transition to remote learning. Now you're starting to sit back and say, okay, what can we do about this? And, and I hope this kind of story, you know, what have we learned and, 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 and how can we apply that to be able to better service the, the students that, that, that we're supposed to be serving within our district, within our school, within our state. And I hope that story sort of sits, you know, comfortably with you, that, that it sounds familiar to you. And that's the sort of the reason that you're here, because if it's not, you're going to be sorely disappointed for the next uh, 49 minutes. Um, but if it is, and, and I think it probably is for most of the folks that found their way here, this is sort of how it's set up. And every single chapter in the book and every one of those sort of decisions that we go through begins with this, this story and the types of questions that the people who are running the Applewood School District and eventually running the online program that they've got and eventually teaching in that online program should be asking of themselves as they're making the decisions to sort of apply these types of things. Um, so the first thing that we want to do is, and I said we use the term, I, I use the term virtual very loosely, and you'll notice the title of the book, while it's online by choice, 
it's designing options for flexible K-12 online learning. Because the reality is, is that depending upon the type of learner that you're looking to serve, what their specific needs are, maybe an online program or a remote program or a distant program uh, isn't what you need. Maybe it's something that's more blended in nature. Maybe it's something that's more hybrid in nature. And um, depending upon who you talk to and, and, and their particular proclivities, they might say that those two terms being the exact same. Others might say that they're completely different. And, and you, when you get them both together, they have wonderful little arguments that make the rest of us smile because um, you know it's difficult around the nomenclature around this. But if you sort of think about it as you know whether or not, and so if I'm using the, the, the T here as my option you know the on-site learning that's when there is no physical or temporal distance between the students and the teacher um, so they're both physically together but they're also doing the same things at the same time whereas remote there is either a temporal distance or a physical distance Synchronous and asynchronous is a little bit more easier to figure out. Synchronous, obviously, is real time. So the folks who are here on the 11th of July or 11th of June with me are the synchronous folks, the folks that are watching this in the recording through the learning lab session. You're my asynchronous folks. And as you look at these different quadrants here, you can see that there are certain affordances as well as certain limitations or challenges that each of these different conditions have. And as you start to build an online, uh, well, a flexible learning program, these are the first questions that you want to begin to ask yourself. You know, who are the students that I am looking to serve with this program? What are their specific needs? And then how can I design a program around those needs? As an example, um, and this is one I always like to use, um, sort of right next door, I guess right across the, the sand dunes from you, um, up in Michigan. Uh, there's a program, uh, the St. Clair County's Regional Educational Service Agency has a virtual learning academy. Um, and it's located up in Port Huron, Michigan. And they had a population of students that were basically being expelled from, um, from their schools. Um, in many cases because they were involved in the juvenile justice system. Um, and that was the reason why they were removed from the brick and mortar schools. Now, as they came out of the juvenile justice system, many of them as a condition of their sentence or a condition of their, their release had to attend school. How do you attend school when you're physically excluded from those brick and mortar schools? Um, so the, on, uh, the, the district there came up with an online program. They started to look at, okay, this particular population of students, what are their needs? Um, one of the things that they determined was that, you know, one of the reasons that these students didn't have success in the classroom wasn't necessarily because they weren't, you know, smart or weren't capable, um, but oftentimes it was because they had too many different things they had to worry about at any one given time. And by worry about, I mean subject areas, right? Most of our kids are taking four or five different subjects in a term. And, you know, so we spend an hour on something and then we say, okay, now turn off your mind about everything we've talked about for the last 60 minutes, because now we're going to talk about something completely different. And I've got to get you to go back and think about all that schema that you have from when we talked about this 26 hours ago or 28 hours ago, or if it's over the weekend, 80 hours ago. Um, so one of the things that they actually set up in the program was students were enrolled in two classes at a time. Um, they had it set up so that it was an online program. But in order to get into the online program, you actually had to physically go to the school and complete this three-day national workforce certification program that was offered completely online. And at the end of that two to three days at the beginning, um, you'd sit down with the, the leadership of the school and basically say, okay, this is how all of your classes are going to look like. You know, is this something that you could do? And, you know, if not, that's fine. They still are able to leave the experience with this national certification in workforce skills that they've got. Um, but it was a good way to sort of test out whether or not that that type of learning was going to be successful for them. They required the students to physically be in the school for eight hours each week over two sittings. Now, when they showed up and for how long, you know, how they broke up that eight hours was entirely up to the student. 
um, the building was actually open from eight in the morning till eight in the evening, Monday to Thursday, and then from eight to four on Friday, and then from noon to four on Saturday, because they recognized again, with this particular population of students, many of them, that idea of going to school at eight in the morning and coming home at three just wasn't an option for them. Um, you know, so they essentially took a look at the characteristics of all of these students and then built a program around them. Uh, the actual online learning that was happening in the program was completely self-paced and asynchronous. Uh, the students were doing two courses at a time. And then as soon as they finished one of those courses, they'd be enrolled in another. So over the course of the school year, they would probably do the same eight courses that every other student in Michigan were doing. They were just doing them two at a time. So they only had to focus upon two at a time and how they focused them were entirely up to them. So I could spend all of my time this week just work focusing upon my math class. And then I don't have to keep switching back and forth between these subject areas to remember these things. And these are the types of questions that you want to ask yourself as you're looking through these four quadrants and how you want to sort of mix and match the type of program that you want to put together. And that's just one example. And in the interest of time, I'll just use one example, but I could pull out dozens of examples that I've seen in countless jurisdictions around the world where you've had these specific programs designed around the needs of a population of students. Now, one of the things I will say that the book does really well there's a lot of these aids throughout the book, and I can't take credit for any of them at all. Every single one of them in the book were all Stephanie's work, even in the chapters that I was responsible for writing. Stephanie was the one that, that came there. But again, it's that sort of how-to model so that if, and this is in the, the initial one when you're starting to look at, you know, what are the needs of the learners? What's the context that they're going to be in? What kind of environment are you trying to create the online program in? Um, these are the questions that as that sort of top level district leader or that top level departmental leader, you'd want to be asking yourself to figure out how you're going to structure the overall program. When we get into the teaching chapters, all of the aids would be useful if you were a teacher in this program. They would essentially be asking you all of those types of questions that you'd want to figure out in terms of the actual delivery of your course. Now, in terms of how you're setting up your course, when you're starting to think about the, say, online or virtual components, or I'll just use the generic term of distance components, so times where you are physically or temporally distant, and I should actually go back and uh, describe that temporally distant. Um, probably the best example I've ever seen of this uh, was a school that I came across in the War Rapper region of New Zealand. Uh, there was a, a teacher there, and I can't remember the name of the school. Um, Nigel Bailey was the, the teacher's name. And he had basically started teaching with their online program uh, probably three or four years earlier and had really gotten a lot out of it and thought it was a really useful model. They were using Moodle for their learning management system. And he had created these Moodle books for all of the courses he taught online. And based upon that, he decided that he was going to essentially use all of that content with his face-to-face -face students. And then the following year, he says to the principal, like, if it makes it easier for you to schedule students in my classes, you don't have to put them all in there at the same time. You know, I've got, there's, there's four 75 minute slots in the day. You can put the students in any of those four slots because I'm not doing any real time teaching to the full group. The students are coming into the room. They're going over to the computer terminals, they're logging into Moodle, and they're starting to take their content through Moodle. So it doesn't matter if I've got six students in there in year seven geography and nine students in there in year 10 history and another five students in year 11 economics because all of the instruction that they're getting is already in Moodle. And I can just be in the room and walking around and interacting with them individually if they've got questions. And if as a small group we need to, you know, get together, we can always move to the middle of the room and I can do, you know, these short micro lessons with them. But essentially there was a temporal or time difference between when the instruction was being provided by the instructor and when the students were actually engaged in it. So throughout periods one through four, he could have students from his seventh year geography class in all four periods. So some of them would never physically sit in the same room together, even though they were in the same course together. 
Um, so that's what I mean by temporal distance when I say, um, you know, di the distance between geography or physicalness and temporal distance or time. Um, so as you're thinking about putting these programs together, in addition to thinking about that asynchronous and synchronous and the face-to-face -face or distant, regardless if it's temporal or uh, geographic, the next thing that we really want to focus upon is how the students are going to interact with the system. And I say the system broadly, sort of meaning the program, if you will. And there's a couple of, of useful sort of theories that go into how to look at this. The first was actually uh, an offhand editorial that Michael Moore, uh, who is uh, sort of one of the founders of the field, of, or at least the academic field of distance education, uh, in the U.S. wrote back in 1989 where he talked about that there were three types of interaction within the distance environment. The student, which is done by the little mortar board over on the um, left-hand side, or at least it's my left, um, and the content, so that's the book. The student and the teacher, who's the guy with the, I guess it's um, this is the really old days when you had the blackboard and you had the, the pointer stick that you used to use to point at the blackboard. I guess we use a laser pointer for that now. Um, so student and teacher or student and student. Those were the three types back in 89 that, that Moore uh, talked about. Um, if you jump ahead five years, uh, because at this point in time, we're getting into the mid nineties, most of the distance learning that we're finding is being offered online. Um, at least at the higher ed level at the time. And as you're all familiar, because we're in one now, um, we started using these technical interfaces, regardless if it's Meets or Teams or the learning management system that we had, or uh, in many cases, there's a student portal that connects all of these different tools together. Um, but, you know, there is an interface that the student has to interact with. Uh, so there was student to interaction or student to interface interaction that was added. And then um, in the early 2000s, um, this, um, uh, I can't remember her first name. I want to say Lisa, but I think I'm wrong with that. Uh, but Dr. Sutton um, came up and it was mainly looking at discussion forums was what she was looking at at the time. Uh, because if you look at the date 2001, it's just before we had the advent of social media. Although for any of you that spend any time on social media at all, this will ring true to all of you. Um, it's what we call vicarious interaction. So it's when the learner experiences an interaction between somebody else and somebody else. Um, if you think about it from, again, a social media sort of context, it's like the lurker phenomenon. Um, if you think about it back to Sutton's time when she was talking about the discussion board, it's me as a student watching the conversation that Matt is having with Teresa and Diana that's happening in the discussion forum. And while I'm not a participant in that discussion, I'm still interacting with it in a vicarious way. Ideally, I'm still learning from it in some way. And as an instructor, the ability to model types of things, even if it's not that direct teacher to student, but to model you know, say if, if again, in this context, if Matt is our instructor here, by Matt modeling something with, with Diana and Martin, I still see that. So while my interaction with in that environment isn't directly between student and student, it's not directly between student and teacher, I'm still seeing what's happening over there. So it's that vicarious interaction or that lurker phenomenon. Um, there we go. So these are the, the five types that, that are there, and they're really sort of the, the common ones that we look at. And it's useful to think about these in terms of how you set up a program. So if we look, for example, first, and let's start again at the top level um, in terms of where you'd be with the book, the type of interface that you have. Um, so I'll use the learning management system as just an example, although we could have used our synchronous tool as an example. You know, what are the types of things that you want from your learning management system? What are the types of tools that it needs to have available? How robust is it going to be based upon how you're going to use it? Is it something that you're going to need to build on your own? Do you want to have some sort of structured navigation on the side? And this is actually um, the, the point of this particular figure is you've got that structured navigation so that the order in which you see things over on the left-hand menu in this particular example is going to be the same in every single course that's offered by this system. 
Um, do you want to have a system where all of the courses have the same look and feel so that the student knows that the course is organized into units and every single unit is organized into a section and each of the sections are roughly uh, one to two weeks in length and each of those sections are organized into lessons and each of the lessons should be roughly one hour to complete and in the case of this particular one here from an online program in Canada you've got the lesson itself is broken up into these five components one that says you will learn which is a student friendly version of the learning objectives one is you should know which essentially is a student friendly version of all the prerequisites that you should have figured out prior to this given that this is unit one section one lesson one my guess is the you should know is probably going to be fairly light here the actual lesson or the content that you want them to figure out is on that third tab then they have this activities tab uh, which is basically all of the summative things that you want the students to do to reinforce their learning um, if you're thinking to a more traditional kind of environment, um, think of it like the seat work that you would do in a regular class. And then there's a, a self uh, quiz that you've got called test yourself, which is not a graded one. So it's also summative in or sorry, formative. My apologies. Both of those should have been formative. Um, they're both formative in nature, um, but it gives the chance, the student a chance to essentially, you know, did they figure out and it's always a multiple choice quiz in the test yourself um, that's auto graded by the system uh, but that structure is present in every single one now this is great for the student because it allows for a great deal of predictability for the student um, but from an instructional standpoint is the structure that we've got here going to be just as good for an english class as it would a science class or math class and you know, there's not necessarily a right answer to that. Um, in many cases, it might deal with the type of learner that you're looking at. If you're dealing with a much more high-end learner, uh, a much more independent learner, maybe ha less structure is actually a, a good thing. It provides the faculty and the teachers that you're working with much greater flexibility to essentially present the material in a way that they feel is best for their particular subject area. If you're dealing with students that um, you know, changing up the structure, changing up the navigation, making them work harder just to access the learning might be an impediment to the learning. Having this kind of structured menu on the right side, having all of the content presented in a nice chunked up way, the same way in every course, regardless of content area, that might be the way to go. Um, you know, but it gets back to this idea of what is the, you know, what is needed from the student? What will serve that particular population of students? And these are some of the decisions that you would make with interfaces. Um, for those of you, for example, who, you know, we're in Google Meets right now. Um, most of you here have probably used Teams or Zoom at some point. Uh, you all know that some of them are much more robust than others. In a system where you want a lot of interaction, having a more robust system might be useful. If your main reason for using the synchronous tool is kind of what we're doing today, where it's mainly a presentation with maybe a little bit of question and answer along the way, then maybe a less robust tool is a better feature for you. Um, so as you're starting to look at that learner to interface, starting to look at who your learners are and what are their needs for that particular population of students. And I keep coming back to that, and I hope one of the things that gets underscored throughout this session is the simple fact that as a district leader, department leader, a school leader, I think that you should have multiple flexible programs. I don't think that a district is going to be able to have one virtual program and have it be successful. Um, it might be successful for some students. But it's not going to be successful for all students because in much the same way that um, in a face-to-face -face classroom we would teach different ways for different students and in many cases we even while formally or even informally group them together based upon ability level um, or based upon characteristics uh, that are you know with um, characteristics uh, uh, learning characteristics or um, you know we teach differently uh, when I taught my AP students, I taught very differently than what I taught my basic geography students. 
Um, you know, and those were two really distinct ability group folks. Uh, when I used to teach my my cultural tourism class back when I was, um, for those of you who can't tell, I'm Canadian. I'm originally from Newfoundland, which is on the far east coast of Canada. Um, and tourism, big thing for us, like it is, I guess, in much of, of New England. I guess further east you go, the more tourism becomes a thing because, well, there's nobody out there except for things to see and do. Um, and um, but my cultural tourism class, I had a full range of students in there from some of the best and brightest in the school to some that were struggling to graduate and many who didn't, um, you know, and even within that one class, I had to <clears throat> be quite accommodated in terms of how I would teach those individual groups. Those we didn't call it at the time, but those micro teaching moments that you have during a class. The difficulty with the online environment is because so much of it is mediated through technology, um, you know, I've got about a dozen people in the room who are here live with me now. I'm going to have countless number that are, are watching this uh, asynchronously. I have little ability to determine, um, you know, what your individual needs are and to adjust how I'm presenting based upon those individual needs, unless someone specifically says something in the chat. And unfortunately, within the K-12 setting, we don't teach our kids to be kind of that blunt and that direct about their needs, especially in a public setting on the fly uh, as you're doing it. The same way with all of the stuff that you put in your learning management system. It's very set in nature. And while you can put lots of different things in there, have different pathways so that different types of students might have success. The reality is, is if you're trying to design a flexible program, that is going to serve all types of students, you're going to fail. That's a, a blunt way of saying it. You need to have multiple programs that are focused upon specific types of students. Um, so let's look at the next one that we've got here. Um, so as we move along, let's go to that content aspect of it. Um, so in all honesty, there's nothing magical about creating online content. Um, any more than there's anything magical about present, you know, creating content that you're going to do in a face-to-face -face classroom. Um, you know, this year is Gagne's nine events of instruction. And while it's one way of designing instruction, and it's one of the sort of tried and true methods, it's only one way. Um, I know myself, I've often had good success with this when I've done it in the K-12 environment, even though I didn't realize that this is what I was doing uh, when I was in K-12, because unfortunately my teacher education program didn't teach me this. I had to wait till I was a PhD student before I was introduced to, to Gagne and his ideas. Um, but, you know, this was a, a reasonable model uh, for me then. It's a reasonable model when I uh, do professional development sessions when I'm teaching in my higher ed environment. And it's a good way of doing that in the face or in the online environment, uh, particularly when we're talking about asynchronous content. And this is where, you know, we have to get a little bit clever with it. So the stuff that we load into the learning management system, how do we make that engaging and how do we draw students into it in the same way that we would, you know, a, a live session, a synchronous session? Um, you know, even that very first event that you have in Gagne's nine events, gain attention. You know, how do you do that in a consistent way? How do you get a student's attention when they're just clicking through a series of web pages? Um, for me, in all honesty, one of the things I often do um, is I have a consistent uh, format that I've got in all of my classes. And believe it or not, almost all of my um, classes begin with some cartoon. Um, so the, the static content that I've got in my learning management system, when you go to click on a particular lesson, the first thing that you will find, and most of the time I do educational research courses, um, is some kind of cartoon, oftentimes that I got from um, Pile Higher and Deeper Comics, uh, PhD Comics. Um, but, you know, there's a number of others that I use, but usually it's something funny about statistics or some other aspect of research. And, you know, while it's, you know, well, I guess the, the proper term these days is, is it's kind of dad jokish, um, the way that the, the thing is. But it's the thing that I do to get people's attention. And the students actually come to expect it um, to the point that I remember a number of years ago when I was at uh, Sacred Heart in Connecticut, um, I was behind on creating my content and I had to throw something up at the last minute because I was a little bit ill leading up to it. And I forgot to include a comic in there. And... The most messages I got and any one day during that entire 16 week course was the day after I released the content without a comic um, because they had come to expect that in the course. That was how I, you know, what I did to gain their attention. 
and that had become their expectation for how the content would be presented. Um, but the rest of them here, I mean, they're things that we would always talk about. Doing. You know, um, I remember when I was a, a, a student myself in, in my teacher ed program, I can still remember my first methods professor saying to me, tell them what you're going to teach them, teach it to them, and then test them on it to make sure they got it. And when he was talking about test, he was thinking in a formative assessment, right? Um, you know, and if you look at Gagne's nine events, there's some of that in there. Um, there's obviously a lot more in there, but that idea of inform the learner of the objection, tell them what you're going to teach them. And then pretty much from prior learning to um, really provide guidance, practice issue, that's the, you know, teach it to them. And then the practice, provide feedback and assess performance. That's the, you know, then test them to see whether they learned it, right? Not that, you know, uh, cleverish a way of saying it, but I mean, it really builds in that sort of idea. And when we're thinking about the asynchronous content, really, it is this kind of this simple model that you can put in. And it doesn't have to be, you know, these specific nine events. Like I say, there are literally hundreds of different uh, models for how to sequence instruction out there. Um, so then if we look at looking at the student to teacher interaction, because um, that's the next thing. So if we've got all of the interfaces or the tools in place and we've got the content created, then the next thing is actually teaching it or the delivery of it. Um, and there's a couple of different ones that you can look at for this. I've always liked the, the social presence um, aspect. Actually, that shouldn't be social presence. I'm going to have to fix this slide for when you do the recording. Um, that should be community of inquiry, it should say at the top, not social presence. I grabbed the wrong slide as I was going through. Um, the community of inquiry model. And basically, the community of inquiry model looks at the interplay between cognitive presence, which is essentially getting the students to think about the topic that you're focusing upon and how to get them to actively be focusing upon the math that you're teaching them as opposed to, you know, the problem that's coming up or the, the hockey game that's, you know, about to be played or the fact that the Oilers lost again last night. Um, hey, I'm Canadian, you know, it's, it's in my blood. Um, with the teaching presence, which is actually the types of things that the teachers do in the class, those types of, you know, the, the real time, the synchronous types of things that you would find with Gagne. Um, and then their social presence. And, and social presence is an interesting one. And I've never really liked how um, Garrison, Anderson, and Archer have defined social presence. Um, it's, it's okay and stuff like that. But if you really go back to um, the original folks that came up with so social presence were a team called Short, Williams, and Christie. And it, they came up with the idea back in 1972. And they were actually talking about it in terms of telephone technology. And the way in which they described it was it's how much you can make the person on the other end of the telephone, or in this case, the other end of the screen, make it feel like you actually care about them. Um, now, they measured it through two variables, immediacy, immediacy and intimacy. So how quickly you respond and then how personally you respond. Um, and, um, you know, how you go about doing that in an online environment. Um, I'm hoping that I, I'm doing some of it with you guys here now. I've been watching the chat and uh, don't worry about the fact that, that you were late. That's perfectly okay. Um, there were others that were that didn't put it in the chat. So that's, you know, so trying to respond to those things as you see them, trying to be personable and, and introducing things about yourself to make the people on the line feel like you're a real person. You know, talking about the fact that I grew up in Newfoundland, tourism, Canada, the Oilers losing last night, and hopefully by the time people are watching this asynchronously winning the cup um, to bring the cup back to Canada for the first time since 1993, uh, when my Montreal Canadiens won was the last Canadian team. You know, those are the types of things that you would look at. And regardless if you're thinking about that from a synchronous standpoint or an asynchronous standpoint, these are the types of things that we're looking at when we're looking at this idea of creating a community of inquiry. You know, hopefully the, the content that I'm giving um, is getting you to think about different programs that you might be familiar with or involved with 
or thinking about and whether or not they've gone through this process that would be the cognitive side of things hopefully you know even though i'm a talking head here i'm hopefully animated and engaging enough that my my teaching presence is coming through and then hopefully i'm making you feel like you feel like i'm a real person on the other side of this and my social presence is coming through you can do the same thing in the asynchronous environment maybe not so much with the course content that gets loaded into the lms um, but most um, teachers for example at the beginning of each week will send out these weekly welcome messages to the students you know welcome to week six this week we're going to be focusing upon x y and z we've got a synchronous session coming up on tuesday you know and and before that i would like you to do these things and if you're in my class you're going to hear about how the habs did last night if they weren't on the golf course uh right now um, and if you're not a hockey fan, basically, when you get kicked out of the playoffs or if you don't make them in the first place, your team ends up on the golf course and the Habs are the colloquial name for the Montreal Canadiens, uh, for those of you who may not be familiar. Um, you know, so this is sort of a way as you start to think about the types of interactions that you're having with your students, be it synchronous or asynchronous. How do you get these three types of things going there? Um, and then the, the next one, you know, is how you start to interact in that that student to student way and you can get the same kinds of things happening um, with that community of inquiry framework thinking about how you can get the students talking to each other because one of the biggest sort of misconceptions that we have in, in education is around this idea of discussion and i always like to, to bring this up because um, it, I was never taught this until I was well into my doctoral program, and it was only because I was doing a lot of educational research and learning the difference between interviews, group interviews, and focus groups that I even learned this. Um, but if I'm a classroom teacher, and say I've got 20 students, and if I've got 20 students as a classroom teacher, I'm working in the best school system in the country because who has 20 students these days? I mean, let's be realistic. Um, but say I've got 20 students. And I ask a question of my students because I want to try to engage them with the discussion. And if, you know, student A responds to my question and student B responds to my question. And then as we go on and I keep sort of asking that initial question in different ways to try to get folks to get involved. If 17 of my 20 kids end up participating, most people would say that's a great discussion. But the reality is, is it wasn't really a discussion. Those 17 kids basically just answered different versions of the same question I asked them. It was more like an interview. It was an interview with me and multiple interviewees, but they weren't talking to each other. Right? A discussion implies that people are actually responding to what other people say within the group. You know, so if I throw out a question and student A gives an answer and student B gives an answer, but then student C comments specifically on something that student a said and then student d says you know well that's funny because as you were talking about that i started to think about and then starts to talk about something that is kind of tangential but still on topic that's a discussion they're actually building new knowledge within the group there and they're talking to each other it's not this back and forth thing that's happening here right and so how i can plan for those kinds of things when i think about how i set up regardless if it's an asynchronous discussion or if I wanted to do something in small groups here in a synchronous session, you know, trying to set up that community of inquiry framework within that kind of environment. So the last one I want to talk about, and, and it's more at a systems level, um, because I'll skip vicarious interaction because that one really plays in with both the student teacher and, and student to student one, because it's basically other students watching that. Um, the only thing that I would um, comment about that is the fact that you want to plan for those types of activities as you're doing them. So when you're thinking about how you're going to manage your discussion, um, planning out how that is going to be reflected to the people who are watching the discussion happen or to who are watching the interaction happen. I keep using discussion as an example, but I mean, we could be creating a collaborative wiki or going into a Google doc and, and doing things that way. Um, you know, there's a number of different ways in which you could do that. Um, but getting back to more of a systems level again, and I know Jared was one of your earlier presenters uh, in the session. I think he might've even been the first one that you had, uh, Jared May, uh, Borup at uh, George Mason University. A uh, very good friend of mine, and I'd be remiss, and I know he talked about his pick rat 
model, which was loosely based upon essentially how you put some of this uh, academic community engagement framework into practice. Um, if he did talk about this and you've already seen it, uh, I'd say refer to him because he's the expert on it. But um, I want to talk a little bit about this because I think that this is a superb framework. It's one of those things that, you know, when you see a colleague do great things, you think to yourself, damn, I'm glad he's doing the, you know, these wonderful things. I wish I'd came up with it first myself. Um, and this is one of those things, because I think this is an exceptional, exceptional model. Um, and it really looks at sort of the larger learning program. And it doesn't have to be regardless. I mean, this is true of a face to face brick and mortar school as much as it is any of these flexible learning programs. You know, you've got the student at the center. And so the student is that black area there. All right. And that is their independent ability. That's how the student will do or perform cognitively, affectively, and behaviorally in terms of their engagement, just with their innate abilities. And while this initial one is nice and, and symmetrical, obviously in the real world, that's not the case. There are some students that you know have a much higher cognitive engagement and a much lower affective engagement. I'd actually be a good example of that. Um, you know, I, I'm someone who I, I can, you know, get into a task from a cognitive perspective very well um, because I was good at school. I, my behavioral engagement was always very high. My affective engagement, particularly as I've gotten older, is quite low. Um, you know, if you talk to anyone who knows me, they will say that there are people that love me and there are people that hate me and there's nobody in between. Um, and I'm perfectly okay with that, which is why my affective engagement is quite low about, you know, the fact that people are like, um, what that does mean is that if there's a certain level of affective engagement that I need to have in order to have success, I'm going to either need support from the course community and by course community there, I mean the learning program or the school or from my personal community. Now, I've always told Jared, the only thing I would have changed with this is I would have flipped the triangles. So I would have put personal in the middle and then course on the outside because I can't change who the students are. The students are coming with their own levels, their own shaped triangles. That black triangle is going to be whatever shape based upon the student. And I can't change that. That's who they are. The reality is, is I can't do much about the personal community either. You know, the kinds of supports that they have in the home, the kinds of supports they have outside of school, outside of the home. So, you know, community groups, extended relatives. I can't control much of that either. Right. So that black triangle and that orange or sorry, that red triangle, I don't have much control over that, regardless if I'm, you know, the principal or a superintendent or an individual teacher or even the, the superintendent of schools or in the case of back home, it'd be the minister of education. Um, I can't control any of that. The only thing I can control is that orange square, that course community support, the types of supports that we put inside of the courses, the types of supports that we build inside of the programs, the types of supports that we put in the place of humans that would be interacting with them, be them teachers, tech support, learning support, coaches, that kind of thing. Right. That orange triangle is the only one that I have any measure of control over whatsoever. So as I'm planning out my online program, I need to make sure that everything that I have in place is going to be there, regardless if the person's black triangle extends well out on all three areas or if it's this little tiny thing whether the person's red triangle is like really broad or it's really slim, right? In theory, that orange triangle should be able to span the entire distance from the far ends of each of those three corners, right? So as I'm looking at how I support my students, as I'm looking at how, uh, you know, the types of, of, regardless if it's career supports, technical supports, personal supports, um, you know, and we're doing much better with online programs these days than we used to do. I can remember back in the early 2000s when there were only three of the statewide virtual schools that had a special educator on staff. Um, because they're statewide supplemental programs, there was a thought that special ed was being handled at the school level. Um, and there were only three at the time, Michigan, Illinois, and Florida, that uh, were offering any virtual special ed support to students that, that needed them. 
um, whereas that's a fairly common factor now. I know you had Mary Rice here earlier that was talking about accessibility. You know, the idea of building accessibility into every single course, regardless if the students need it or not, is a good example of taking that orange triangle and expanding it out to cover the full area. Because if the students need it, it's there. If they don't need it, it's still there. Right? And so these are the things you want to think about from a, a, a strategic or structural level as you're looking at it. Um, so we've got about 10 minutes left, and I haven't seen any comments come up in the chat because uh, I've been trying to sort of uh, watch as we were going because if it was more advantageous to do them as we were going, um, I would. And But I also know that before I get to questions or while Matt is – accommodating questions, I should put that slide up for a second because at least for recording purposes, um, I don't know if you conclude the Q&A in the recording or not, but if not, at least then this is, uh, if you do think of something after the fact or if you're watching this asynchronously, uh, you can always reach me there at that email address and um, all of my presentations, my scholarship uh, is all available on my website as well as a blog that I maintain that uh, anything related to K-12 online distance learning that comes across my electronic desk uh, ends up on that blog. So um, I will uh, let you moderate some questions and uh, I will try to provide some answers there, Matt. Yes, yes. And if folks that are here live do have questions, can feel free to add those to the chat. I kind of wanted to start with, with one myself, if you don't don't mind. Um, you know, you kind of talked a, a, a lot about, um, you know, different, you know, times where the certain things need to be planned or you know maybe meetings that, that that are happening which is probably what um a lot of folks that are tuning into this session uh, might be doing um just kind of wondering your thoughts on you know who you think it would be valuable to you know get input from when making some of the decisions that um that you talked about throughout the session oh that's actually a wonderful question so what stakeholders should we be looking at um, I mean, I think as you're looking at it, you know, I said begin with the question of what population of students are you targeting with this specific type of program. Um, once you get to that stage, you know, once you've identified at least some of the general characteristics of who it is you'd like to reach or who it is that's not being served, starting to bring those folks in right away, I think is useful. Um, you know, they're I don't know the statistics in the U.S., and I apologize about this. And if I had more time and, and wasn't ill most of the past week, I would have looked it up. Um, but I'm on sabbatical this semester, and I just got back from New Zealand. And I can tell you that since the pandemic, um, approximately, I think, what was the statistic I was reading there? 54% um, of students in the Auckland area attend school regularly now which essentially means that 46% attend irregularly or don't attend at all, right? So if I'm a, and, you know, I know that we're facing similar problems here in the U.S. Um, you know, we've got, regardless of state, you look at, regardless of most cases, regardless of district, you look at what your student population was in, at the beginning of the 2019-2020 school year, and you compare it to now, there's a lot of students that we've lost somewhere. So figuring out who those students are, reaching out to those students um, and fire those former students, I guess, finding out like, why aren't they, why aren't you coming? You know, why aren't you enrolling in school? Finding out from their parents, finding out from teachers in schools that have had the hardest hit in terms of enrollment problems, or for that matter, the ones that aren't having success. Because um, in a lot of cases, it's not just about recapturing students. There are a lot of students that are in our classrooms, but they're not really in our classrooms. You know, they physically show up, sure, you know, but they're not there to learn um, or they're not learning while they're there, um, either or. And I think there's a little bit of both happening there, um, you know, finding out from them. I mean, one of the things when I uh, I taught that basic geography class, it was my last year teaching before I went off and did my doctorate. Um, it was actually my the special ed teacher that suggested it because uh, of the 26 students I had in the class, 23 of them had IEPs. And the, the special ed teacher, this this old guy who grew up in the area, had actually went to the precursor to the school before the new one was built, you know, says to me one of these days, well, have you just asked them? And it was one of the, the biggest epiphanies I ever had because I was trying to come up with all these wonderful ways of trying to engage them and stuff like that. And I'd never taken the time to just ask those students, like, what types of things have teachers done in the past that you found useful? 
what types of things have teachers done in the past that you absolutely hate, uh, that you found completely useless? And then trying to build my own instruction around that. Um, you know, so once you've identified the population of students that you're looking at, that you're trying to, to serve with a particular type of program, trying to get direct feedback from those closest to those students, including the students themselves, I think is the, in my mind, the next step. Even if you're willing to get, if some of them would be willing to be involved, having them as part of the group that like, when you're looking at different learning management systems, having two or three of them actually as part of the group, making those decisions, providing feedback on that kind of thing, having parents do those types of things. Because when you look at that, again, those triangles that were there, some students will have a very robust red triangle. They're going to have a lot of support in the home. Some students won't. So what types of things as a flexible program can you provide that are going to provide similar types of services that you would have to a parent that's really actively engaged in their child's learning, that's making sure that they're doing their work, that's making sure that they've got connectivity, that even knows where the connectivity is. Um, like the number of online programs that if you were to ask a teacher or an administrator in that program, you know, where are the best uh, public Wi-Fi locations in your community? who can't answer that basic question. You know, I mean, to me, that's like a, a, a no brainer if you're running an online program, knowing that many kids don't have connectivity at home. Well, where do you tell them to go? All right. Well, thank you so much, um, Dr. Barber. I'm sure this will be, you know, really useful for folks who are, you know, having these conversations, thinking through, you know, a lot of these um, issues. If anybody in the, the um, the room here live with us does have additional questions can can feel free to add those to the chat um if you are here live can can stay tuned uh in just a moment we'll have someone uh from five star on to provide a code with your pgps and if you are watching on demand um your pgps will be added to the learning lab automatically when the session ends um i hope that uh everybody has enjoyed the session be sure to check out the link of uh, the collection link with all of the different sessions dr barbara mentioned a, a few of those uh, sessions that we held previously as well. So thank you everybody uh, for being here today and, and thank you Dr. Barber for presenting.